the large Tibetan community in India such an important part not just of our shared identity and our shared culture is a movement which actually brings together people across the world. At one level it is grounded in the beliefs of the Dalai Lama. Uh, at another level it is believed in the integrity and the identity of the Tibetan people and uh, the battle for an identity and the territorial acceptance of Tibet as what it historically once was. Um, India is a key partner of the Tibetan people, the Tibetan government, and we have a wonderful guest today to speak with us, uh, His Excellency Sekyong uh, Penma Chedding. He is the, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, the Tibetan movement. Thank you, sir, very much for being with us. I must ask you first, since um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama brings so much joy to people in India and around the world, he's had, I believe, a knee surgery in the United States. How is he feeling? Uh, considering his age, now that he's uh, already 89, uh, he's recuperating very well. Uh, the, now you have uh, too many uh, uh, development and technologies. The surgery itself, I think, took less than one and a half hour, which we have both mechanical and manual uh, treatment. Then, of course, it mm -hmm. takes a few days for the swelling to go down. Uh, that has gone down, and his holiness. Uh, uh, moved to north of New York, a uh, much little more quieter place where he could rest and undergo physiotherapy. Yep. So I am told by uh, people who are attending to him uh, that his holiness is recovering very well, but he will need some more weeks of physiotherapy. And his spirits, because we can't imagine uh, the holiness without a smile on his face. That I'm sure is radiating happiness to people everywhere, as always. Yeah, in between, uh, I'm sure you also must have seen, I think it was covered by the media as well, that uh, on 6th of July was His Holiness' 89th birthday yes. and he did send a message to everyone around the world and he continues to have that smiling face. You had a very important visit, a US congressman recently uh, who'd come up to Dharamshala to understand where the movement presently is and it's also part of an effort in the United States to push through the Tibet-China Dispute Act. Tell us why this is important for your cause. Now we follow uh, what is called as the middle way policy which is a Buddhist concept extreme, avoiding extreme polarities. So this is a concept which is holiness proposed uh, supported by a larger number of Tibetans and unanimously approved by the Tibetan parliament in exile and this continues to be our official position. So me being the Sikong or the directly elected political leader uh, does not mandate me to change that policy or the parliament by itself cannot. So if, if and when we change this policy there has to be a referendum according to our charter under article 56 of our charter. So that being the case, uh, we are committed to following His Holiness uh, 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 thinking on resolving the Sino-Tibet dispute uh, through non-violence, uh, through a negotiated solution uh, that is mutually beneficial both for the Chinese people and the Tibetan people and that would be long-lasting. So that is the policy we continue to follow but we decided to change our strategy a little bit since I came into this position. Uh, when we say middle way, then you talk about extremes or polarities. And if there is no recognition for polarities, then there is no value for middle way. Yeah. So one polarity is the situation of occupied Tibet uh, under the repressive communist government, which we, we keep talking about to the, to the uh, governments and yes. public and you know, representatives. But uh, the other polarity, which is the historical status of Tibet as an independent state, was not uh, pushed to the limit that we would have won. So there are four reasons why we went for this. One is to send a clear message to the Chinese government that they cannot change history. Because history is in the past. Yeah. And uh, let's leave that to historians. So when Chinese put this precondition to His Holiness, that His Holiness should say Tibet has been part of China, his Holiness says, I'm a Buddhist monk. Yeah. I cannot lie on history. So let's leave history to historians. What matters more through the middle way policy is to bring more happiness for the Chinese people and the Tibetan people. And that's what His Holiness aspires for. So if there is no recognition for the polarities or the extremes, then there is no value for middle way. That's why we decided to reach out to United States as, as government 
to, to uh, see what we can do about this and we met uh, strategize on this since April 2022 so yes. it has already been two years and three months till we got this uh, signed by sure. President Biden so there are a lot of people involved in this the congressmen and women staffers whole lot of people within the Tibetan community also we have our office of Tibet there and, uh, representatives in the international campaign for Tibet who has been there for a very long time since 87 and they have the institutional memory uh, we work together very closely sure. to get this done in the house and the senate and from November 26 last year to it took about eight months to get it but even before that there sure. were a lot of knots that need to be untied but let me ask you this since um one of the biggest concerns or problems with regard to China is the identity of the Dalai Lama himself. And what they keep saying is that he's not purely a religious person, that he has a political avatar. And they, 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 they dispute uh, his, his role and they say that he, essentially he's a politician, when in fact he's a lot more than that. Um, you know, he, he appeals to people around the world. He is um, so much more profound in his identity. How would you respond to what China says on this particular thing? I, uh, sometimes I fail to understand uh, why China fears a simple monk like His Holiness the Dalai Lama. They are the second, second largest economy in the world. They have all the influence. Uh, they have managed to convince or ask every country to say Tibet is part of PRC over the years. And they have always tried to defame his Holiness by calling him a monk in wolf's clothing and uh, all kind of things. But everybody knows, sometimes I ask this question as to who really wants Tibet to be separated from China. Yeah. Because His Holiness keeps repeating like a mantra, middle way, middle way, all the time. And Chinese government keeps calling him a separatist. And the fact is that Tibet was an independent country. Yes. They invaded our country, they pushed us out, and then they called His Holiness as separatists. And uh, now the question is, who really wants Tibet to be separated from China? Is it the Chinese government who keeps calling His Holiness as separatists, despite His Holiness keeps uh, keeping on repeating this uh, middle way policy? The whole world knows. So who are they trying to fool? That is the main problem. So. And the fear of one Lama, uh, like His Holiness, against the Chinese government, that is something unfathomable in our mind. Uh, His Holiness always has a very larger understanding of the world, holistic understanding. And the reason why he went for the middle way is also because he appreciates the concept of European Union. Sure. Uh, even now he says if it is not for the concept of European Union, Europeans will still be fighting with each other. If that can be applied to Europe, then why not Tibet with China? Sure or in the whole region. Whether we like it or not, we cannot lift Tibet out of that place and put it somewhere in the Arabian or Bay of Bengal near India. So we don't have a Hanuman to lift Tibet no. out of that place. So whenever we get to go back, we have to learn, learn we have to live in peace with, yes. na with China or India or yes. all our neighbors like we, we, we did with for centuries. But Your Excellency, since we are talking about China, one of the biggest concerns here in India is the quote-unquote salami slicing of territory which China does. It's not just in Ladakh and uh, attempts at salami slicing into Arunachal Pradesh but also the the sovereign nation of Bhutan where even areas uh, which have been under the royal family of Bhutan, their um, uh, historic and their legacy areas, ancestral lands have been taken over by the Chinese physically. Is this not perhaps the most profound threat that so many nations around the world face, Chinese expansionism. Yeah. China is always in a denial mood, as every one of us knows. When we talk about China's hegemonistic ambitions, they say we don't have hegemonistic ambitions. The very fact that China invaded Tibet in 1959 was their first step in, uh, in, in an expansion of China. Before that, with uh, Uyghurs and the Inner Mongolians, uh, so what they do and what they say are two different things. Uh, that is what they have always been saying. And some eight, ten years ago, if you remember, China declared air identification zone. Yes. You know, at that time, I told our U.S. friends, when China can claim the air, they will claim everything under that air, whether yes. it's sea or land or whatever. So 
these days uh, China's ambi uh, hegemonistic ambitions are also reflected in terms of how they are renaming places, not just in Arunachal Pradesh or belligerents on Ladakh. Because I've been to Arunachal Pradesh in, in, in the north of Sikkim, to Ladakh, everywhere, because I've never been to Tibet. So to fulfill my emotional needs, I go on the border area, also to meet with my people who live there and see Tibet from across the border. So China's uh, on anything, whether you talk about overcapacity of EV vehicles, they deny it. So anything that the world points a finger at China, China keeps denying, and this is uh, definitely a huge threat, not only to India, but you know, after the BRICS summit, uh, the last BRICS summit in South Africa, China came out with those maps once yes. again. Yes. It was not like yes. they are coming out for the first time. But the timing is such that, you know, all the neighboring countries from Japan to Taiwan to Philippines, now they are having serious problems in strategies. Uh, you know, and then Malaysia, Brunei, uh, Vietnam, everywhere, uh, they, they are escalating uh, the situation and then also because of their behavior, all the defense expenditures of all these countries are going on, I increasing every year, including okay. New Zealand and Australia. Absolutely. But uh, Your Excellency, let me ask you, you know, one of the areas which hasn't been spoken about very much in the past but increasingly is, and perhaps that's a good thing, is um, uh, the Vikas Force. Uh, it is um, a Tibetan army, but it is well in integrated with the Indian army uh, <coughs> in as much as they worship the Tibetan cause, they protect India's sovereignty and they've done it in 1971 and they've done it in Ladakh as well. Um, could you tell us about how Tibetan soldiers are an intrinsic part of what both you and I believe, the sovereignty of nations and their territorial integrity? Uh, maybe I would like to add one more here. Yes. We have the Vikas, then we have the Indo-Tibetan border force, border police. Uh, that is why I keep saying the very fact that the Indian government has not changed the name from Indo-Tibetan border police, Indo-Tibetan border force to Indo-China border police, and border, that also underlies India's position on Tibet. Um, if you, uh, if we go back in time, of course there was CIA Tibet collaboration in the late 50s, uh, starting from 57 till up to 1968. Uh, uh, that cooperation was there, but India was not friendly with US at that time. Pakistan was more friendly. So if you meet read Nurulmaker by His Holiness elder brother, Nurulmaker of Kalimpong. Yes. Uh, there also you'll find we have to send people from Bangladesh, yes. from East Pakistan, instead of from Indian soil. But for the first time, after Hindi Chini Bye Bye 1954, uh, India declaring Tibet region of China and all that, after eight years as Chinese government planned at that time with Mao and Tao and Lai at the helm of affairs, they attacked India in 1962. Yes. So that realization brought the combination of United States and Tibetans. And so they started one office in Saket. I see. Way back in 1964, the axis of India, US, and Tibetans. So for the first time, then they decided to have this cooperation. And then they established the 22, uh, where Tibetans were deployed to. Because we always lived in the mountains. Uh, so we have this lung, lung. special <laughs> lung uh, to go to the borders. Uh, even last time, uh, they, our people have uh, participated in the Bangladesh war uh, also. So we have played an important role in, in freeing Bangladesh uh, alongside, of course, under the command of Indian Army and in Kargil war. So most of the engagements, we were there. And last time, three years ago, when I was in Ladakh, I met a commandant and he was saying, I'm very lucky to be commanding such a Vikas because at that time, that Vikas, that particular Vikas was the one to find out incursion on the Depsang plains. Yes. So I think the uh, Defense Minister was also there, Rajnath Singh Ji, and the, the Army Chief, the Joint Army Chief was also there, and the CO was called, and he thought he could be reprimanded, but uh, they said, you have done a good job, the Vikas people have done a good job. So. Uh, the topography, the, the, the altitude and all that are suitable for the Tibetans and if there is any way that we can contribute uh, to, to uh, in some ways, you know, to repay our debt to the Indian government for all the hospitality and everything that you did for us, uh, this is in some way to pay, repay 
the government of India and we are still playing a very important role. Even with your lives because those soldiers put their lives on the line. Soldiers are meant to put their lives at risk in the forefront before the civilians so that is how they are brought up until the end. What if, I want to go back to the Tibet-China Dispute Act. One of the key objectives is to stop Chinese disinformation yes. uh, because so much of um, the information flow is skewed. Um, could you tell us how that's a primary objective? Yes, that is, as I mentioned before, we changed our strategy to focus on the historical aspects. I mentioned about the first message to the Chinese government, the second message to the international community because over the last 40-50 years China managed to force mm -hmm. or coerce every country to say that Tibet is part of PRC mm -hmm. and in China they, they keep saying Tibet has been part of China since uh, ancient times. So this is the core of that uh, legislation, of that act where the U.S. government says that they do not accept Chinese narrative or assertion that Tibet has been part of China since ancient times and His Holiness also has also not accepted in their findings as well as in the act itself. So which means that uh, uh, so far the Chinese government has been saying that there is not a single country who re recognizes the independence of Tibet or there is not a single country who recognizes the government in exile. Yeah. Now, that is the second part is another matter, but with this act now in place, would the Chinese government be able to say there is not a single country who does not recognize or who recognizes the independence of Japan? What about India and the fact that, uh, you know, I mean, we back your cause 110 percent. What is the state of that relationship? And it's not just uh, uh, a relationship of brothers and sisters or in, uh, it's, it's also an economic relationship at one level. It is also about sustaining Tibetan communities within India at so many levels. You were talking to me about Tibetan schools. Um, so when you look at the relationship, the official relationship with the government of India, uh, is it a, a glass half empty or a glass half full? I would say glass half empty, but it's, it's still, I'm sure there's still a lot of things in the works which we may not be aware of because it's not necessary that the Indian government has to tell us everything. But we are being very transparent with the Indian government uh, on many matters and uh, the support that we have received is tremendous, uh, particularly on humanitarian count, but on political issues. Uh, there are more, a lot of things uh, between China and India right now. Uh, so it's up to the leadership of India as to when, how they need to take this up. Uh, I'm nobody to advise the Indian government. I know there are a lot of sharp people at the helm of affairs. Uh, and uh, as I tell everybody, uh, particularly our own people, that we have to understand that if there has to be a resolution to this Sino-Tibet dispute through the middle way policy, there's no other way than by reaching out to the Chinese government. Now, on the other hand, uh, till such a time, then we have to reach out to the international community. Now, when we reach out to the international community, we can't expect that co country to leave aside their national interests and then take up na Tibet's national interest. It's the same case with India as well. But uh, the difference between India and U.S. or Europe, U.S. is also because of India's proximity of border with Tibet. Uh, now that has become in uh, China. So there are a lot of, I think, political expediencies that need to be taken into consideration when it comes to India's relation with China. But at the same time, we find that, uh, you know, at the beginning of uh, President Modi, Prime Minister Modi Ji's uh, tenure, he made every effort to, to uh, get better relations with China by inviting Xi Jinping to Gujarat, to Mahabalipuram, and he himself visiting Beijing and Wuhan and all that, all that brotherhood, Brahaha, Panchil, even now Panchil is being talked about despite all the historical. So despite all the efforts from Indian government side, the response from the Chinese government has not been uh, up to the mark. No. So there's, there's serious questions like does, when it comes to U.S.-China relations, they say, oh, we are not being treated equal. But the question is, do China treat India equal? or for that matter, any other country in the region. You know, so these are very, they talk about uh, peaceful dialogue. Uh, where is peaceful dialogue with Tibetans, with Uyghurs, with Mongolians, or Hong Kongers, or Taiwanese? 
But when it comes to Ukraine and other things, they hope they should be peaceful, negotiated dialogue. So they say one thing and they do another double thing. A lot of double standards and even international law. It is a law if it helps them. If it is not a law, if it doesn't help them. One final question. I was just struck by what you told me that uh, you were in the north of Sikkim and you looked across and you saw Tibet. Um, it must be tremendously painful for you that uh, you are the prime minister in exile of, uh, of Tibet of the Tibetan people and you haven't been to your own home. Um, how do you deal with that? No, this is an emotional uh, thing that we have to keep it very close to our heart. That's the only thing we can do because China does not give access for us to visit. Even in 21st century, you still have countries like China where your own people cannot step on your soil. So, this is very unfortunate. That's why we are trying to seek a solution where we can go back, visit our families, visit our, you know, uh, see our land by ourselves. So the only thing we can do is now go on Google. When we were growing up, there was no Google also. So now I call it the Google Rinpoche. Right. <laughs> because you ask Google and you get to see everything. So that's all we can do. Go on Google, look at maps. And now China is changing China, Tibet's name also. And destroying the background to that, uh, all the historical background to that. So we are also developing, we have to develop uh, another map that is searchable on the internet with Tibetan names. Yes. Because China is changing all the names. Uh, and these are, these are going to be very consequential. And particularly the colonial boarding schools. And these will have serious impact on India's security from a long-term perspective. Because right now, we Tibetans, there are stories that the first king of Tibet came from India. So that is how old our relationship going back 2,300 years ago. And then the Tibetan script came from India. The Tibetan Buddhism came from India. Today China claims that Tibetan Buddhism came from China. That's, not a, that's again another uh, distortion of facts. So Tibetans have remained and we transliterated every available Sanskrit and Pali text into Tibetan language on the advice of Shantarakshita. So we are the only country that has, that has become a repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom which is manifested in the messages of His Holiness to the world. So we are very proud people uh, being a repository of one part of ancient Indian wisdom and we respect India because India is the land of Buddha, uh, you know, we call it the land of Aryavarat. So we have a lot of respect. Now with China changing the curriculum turning the boarding schools into teaching just Mandarin and a Communist Party ideology and loyalty and military training and all that uh, will wean away the emotional uh, quotient that we have with India and that will affect India also in long, if this continues for a long, for a long time. What about the entire um, debate about uh, who succeeds the Dalai Lama eventually? China has been pushing you know, their own uh, version of events, their, uh, you know, I mean, their... It's, yes, it is about reincarnation. Xi Jinping should think about his reincarnation, if he is really serious. It's the person who is going to be reborn, who is going to decide where he or she will be born. It's not somebody else who will decide. The whole concept of reincarnation is very unique to Tibetan Buddhism. Yes. And that's understood by the Tibetans, not the Chinese. That is why His Holiness always jokingly, humorously says that if Chinese leaders are really serious about Dalai Lama's reincarnation, of course they are not bothered about the living 14th, but they are more concerned about the yet to come 15th. So uh, His Holiness gives, if they are really serious, they should study Tibetan Buddhism. They should believe in life after death. Yeah. And then maybe they should look for Mao Zedong's reincarnation first. Right. Uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, second, Chang Zemin is also not with us now then maybe the Dalai Lamas. So first they have to be convinced with that idea of reincarnation, believe in it and then uh, practice it. Right. Without believing in it, just to use it as a political tool, thinking that if you can control the Dalai Lama, you can control all the Tibetans, doesn't work. Yeah. You have the case of Penchen Lama, yeah. when he was abducted at six with his family, we don't know whether he's living or not. So now I say, and I think China made a strategic mistake at that time because they got very angry that His Holiness announced and then they decided to abduct this kid and they appointed. Yes. So this boy is appointed by the Chinese government, is not respected and regarded by any Tibetan. No. So just recently he was in Amdo region, my father's birthplace also. Mm -hmm. 
the Chinese Pension Lama, and there were not many visitors to see him, and they have to pay money, 100 yuan for one family to go and listen to him or see him. And then there are families who receive uh, benefits from the government. It's mandatory for them to send their family to receive right. it. So these, these facades are there to show the world that Tibetans believe in the Chinese Pension Lama. And the Tibetans say he's just another leader. Right. They, don't, they don't believe in him. So if that has happened to Pension Lama, so I tell them, have you not learned any lesson from the Pension Lama Saba? You just cannot force people to, you know, believe or trust another. Sure based on their volition. Your Excellency, it's been wonderful speaking to you and, um, you know, for sharing uh, your vision of Tibet, your vision of the future and, of course, the message of His Holiness uh, as well. It's so important to people around the world. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.